Thanks for listening to the Innovation Experts, a new global podcast brought to you by Farnell, Newark, and Element 14, where you can find out about the latest innovations in the world of electronics. Hello and welcome to our next interview from the Innovation Experts, a global podcast by Farnell, Newark, and Element 14. My name is Cliff Ortmeyer and I'm the Global Head of Technical Marketing, joining you from Chicago. Today we have Kai Sharman, who is the Business Development Manager of Hioki, based in Frankfurt, Germany. Welcome to the podcast, Kai. Hi Cliff, thanks for having me. So, let's start off you telling us a little bit about yourself and what led you to Hioki. So I'm a communication engineer originally and uh, moved into the test and measurement industry about a decade ago. Where I live in Frankfurt is typically not a test and measurement hotspot when it comes to companies which have the offices here. So I got approached by a headhunter for a role which is only two miles away from my house. Of course, then I was curious about that. And uh, then I found out it was Hioki which I knew before because they're fairly well known for current sensors. And I didn't know what kind of portfolio they have. So I went there, had a discussion with them and actually saw the huge potential um, of the company, especially in Europe. And that was the reason why I joined them and never regretted a day since. (laughs) Yeah, excellent. So obviously you'd heard of Hioki and a lot of our listeners have too, but for those that haven't, can you tell us a little bit about Hioki? Yeah, Hioki is actually making test equipment since 1935, Um, so it's a fairly traditional and old company. And actually, they started to make test and measurement instruments straight from the word go. So they didn't start with washing up liquid and then after 50 years turn to TNM, but it's really a test and measurement company straight from the word go. And turnover-wise, Hioki is not a huge player. They have an annual turnover of around 200 million euros and a little bit more than a thousand employees. Especially given that size, they the portfolio is really impressive because Hyoki has maintenance instruments like DMMs, clamp meters, insulation testers and battery testers. But Hyoki also has a benchtop instruments like power analyzers, current sensors, data acquisition systems, LCR meters, impedance analyzers, resistance meters, and again, battery testers. And finally, Hioki is making flying probe testers and other automatic test equipment. But I have to say that Europe isn't a focus area for us for these kind of products. Yeah, okay. So pretty full portfolio. And I know you mentioned uh, battery testers. So obviously, more and more equipment's becoming battery powered. And what do you see the impact on design is with this move? Well, I think if you look at the development of batteries, especially lithium ion batteries, um, They have changed so many things in the last couple of years. I look at my watch, which is like a sports watch with GPS in it. I had the same thing about 10 years ago, and that model looked like these kind of relics from the Soviet era, these huge batteries in there, huge clunky, undesignable thing. And if you look at how they look now, it's only possible because batteries have become better. There are several things you have to then also do because You've got batteries that get more powerful, and then to make this whole thing possible, you also have to look at electronic and design that draws less energy and uses less power. And also you need smarter software in it. So just to stick to that GPS watch example, I think just the GPS capacity of my model is like I don't know, 36 hours or something like that. And the model that has already been released has twice of that. So it's a huge steps and they have achieved that with a mix of better batteries, better hardware design and smarter software. And of course, in an electric car, for example, it's very difficult to increase the mileage that you can do with it, with the software. You're very limited with that. There, the battery capacity is very important, but also the inverters that you would use. So they're tweaking the inverters, for example, to get the maximum out of that battery charge. It's huge changes that have happened or that are actually possible with in, in the last years. Yeah, I guess you think about the, the batteries themselves and just the advances that have been made there. You know, I do a lot with the RC cars and planes and things like that, and uh, just the amount of runtime that you can get with the batteries is amazing but yeah. i think you, you, you know you called out right it also has a just as much to do with the software and especially with the, the power supply itself and how it's uh, measuring it so 
that makes a huge difference. And just to give you an example, one of the fields where we're active in is we have test equipment that lets you measure the entire drive chain of an electric car. And the key part of that is the inverter. And I would say there's almost as much energy going into designing inverters now with silicon carbide and GAN technology. The switching clock rates are going up so much now. You need really precise measurement equipment to be able to measure the gains that they are doing. Because you have an inverter that has like, I don't know, 89% efficiency in moving a, a voltage and a current from one type to another, like from one phase battery to three phase AC, for example. And increasing or improving that efficiency, if you can increase the efficiency of your inverter by a tenth of a comma, like one tenth behind the comma, like point something, that's time to get out the champagne. Really? That is the big impact already. And that, of course, means that you need super precise test and measurement equipment, because if you've got an instrument that measures with an inaccuracy of 1%, how do you quantify your gains of 0.1% in your inverter efficiency? So actually, the instrument's accuracy can make or break your approval with, uh, in the US, you have the EPA, for example, just to stick to certain like WLTP limits the, a good test and measurement equipment can really help to, to pass that, actually, because you can show that you have the right accuracy. Yeah, when I think about a, a watch or anything like that, any wearable device, obviously you think, all right, you know, anything that you can pull out of that is absolutely critical, you know, from a consumer standpoint. But I'm, I'm really amazed uh, to think about, like, for electric cars and things like that, that that small amount of gain is really that big of a deal and i'm guessing that when you're dealing with such high power and such high currents that i would have thought the accuracy didn't have to be as tight as you would think for something as uh, small as a watch but it, it sounds like accuracy is probably one of the key one of the key things that you have to have especially in terms of the test equipment if you're going to make those gains and just trying to handle those kinds of currents and, uh, and voltages with that much accuracy seems like a pretty daunting task it is, but it's really, really important. I mean, if you look at an inverter and if an inverter has 89% efficiency, where do the 11% go? And that's heat. And just one of the things you want to reduce, for example, is uh, is uh, heat in your car. And you don't want to have that good energy of that mileage being converted into heat. You want to have it going into your engine at the end of the day or into your motor. And I think there is many, many points or every kind of component in an electric car they look at and trying to improve that. And one of the things, of course, is the inverter. On the other side, it's the batteries as well. So if you see how much development is going into new types of batteries and how to improve batteries, that's a huge, huge amount of investment going in there just in terms of resources. How many, it's, it's incredible what's happening there and what has started to happen there in the last I don't know, 10 years, things have really taken off. For us, this is really interesting because we're a Japanese company and especially when you compare it to Germany where I am, Germany has always been a little bit behind accepting electric drives, accepting battery powered cars because they really like the three liter engine and when you push the metal to the, put the metal to the floor, then you want to have that roaring sound, which obviously you don't have with an electric car, which is fed by a battery. But even just if you look at the amount of changes that you see happening with a battery development, it's absolutely huge. At the beginning, the first electric cars of that famous brand everybody's talking about, they basically had 18650 cells put in serial. The mm. standard cells that you find in your vape cigarette thing, these kind of cells, they were basically putting in series and they got a hell of a result out of it. But that has nothing to do with where they are at the moment or where the industry is at the moment. If you look at the kind of cells that are being developed now, that's really special, specific, fantastic products. Also trying to reduce the amount of ingredients that are difficult to get. So for example, lithium ion batteries, they tended to have a lot of cobalt inside of it, which is not exactly the most green 
product you can buy on the planet. And if you see how much cobalt was in lithium ion batteries 10 years ago and how much is in there now, it's like a small fraction of that from what happened 10 years. So it's a huge amount of development going on in that area. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like from the test equipment perspective from your side, there's a lot of areas that you got to focus on. And I'm guessing the power and the current, uh, in terms of being able to test, what are some of the key parameters that you really have to test for that we might not even think of? Because obviously when you're thinking about a battery, you think normally, yeah, voltage and current. So <laughs> Yeah, what? Now, voltage and resistance is usually what you see. and It really depends on whether you look at it from a maintenance point of view or whether you look at it from an R&D point of view. You probably know this when you bring your car into your garage, your local garage, and they check the battery for that. Then they have a classical battery tester which puts a load on it. And it basically from that load you put on it and from the current draws and from the resistance change, they can tell you, is that battery okay or is it not okay? Imagine to do that in a production line, first of all. You would need an awful lot of loads for if you would test a cell like that. So what you typically do, you have something called an AC measurement. You just put an AC test voltage onto that um, battery and you can do within a split second you can say what is the resistance of this cell so that's for example the big difference between production and maintenance outside in the field when you look at r d you need to look for example what is the resistance level between the active material and the electrode material just as an example so basically we're now talking about a a lithium ion battery rolled up in its original state. So if you imagine the 18650 standard cell, and if you compare that with an electrolyte capacitor, if you roll that out, it's basically just one flat sheet. And that's pretty much the same what an 18650 cell looks like. So it's basically a rolled up capacitor. Well, obviously any battery engineer will now cry high heaven of that I make that comparison but at the end of the day just from a principal point of view that's the same there's a lot of electrolyte involved in this case as well and what you basically need to do is you need to check what is the resistance between the active material and the electrolyte voltage and current is one thing what voltage and resistance actually is something that you would measure more in the maintenance side you measure that in the production side you have different ways of measuring that for example if you get your car battery measured that's typically happening with a load by putting a load on it if you would put a load onto every battery you would measure in a production environment then that would be a lot of time that would be a very time consuming task so typically what you do you do so something called an ac measurement which means you put an ac voltage onto your battery cell and you can within split seconds basically say whether that battery is okay or not by measuring the resistance and the voltage. In R&D, especially in lithium ion batteries, you have to look at a couple of other things. One of those things would be, for example, the interface resistance between the electrolyte material and the cathode or the anode. That's one thing. And also what you would do is you would sweep frequencies. You would make measurements of that battery cell over various frequencies. And depending on the outcome, you basically measure the battery impedance on certain and various frequencies. And depending on the outcome, you can judge what is the state of that battery and is this going to be a good battery or not. This is one of the things that you do in the R&D process as well. Frequency yes. is important as well, actually impedance and frequency obviously you've got battery testing at all different phases you've got it in the design phase of designing yeah. a battery versus yeah. when you're on the bench and you're obviously trying to figure out what the lifetime you know value of how long the battery is going to last actually versus even when you're in the maintenance when you're going to the auto shop or something like that i mean it seems like uh the way that you're talking about testing we know the lipos are obviously going to be different than a lead acid, but I mean, is the measurement technique, because the measurement techniques are so different, is that why you see different types of methods or is it because of cost? It is a cost thing. So our most favorite battery tester for the maintenance industry is for lead acid batteries. That's a unit called BT3554 and that unit originally designed for lead acid batteries is so sensitive that you can also measure lithium-ion cells. The only problem that you have is that 
a lithium ion cell is so much harder to detect whether it's an okay battery or whether it has deteriorated than a lead acid battery. A lead acid battery, you can really from the voltage and the internal resistance, you can very, very quickly say that battery needs to be replaced or not. And that's typically a measurement that you do at just one frequency. But if you only measure one frequency at a lithium ion battery, it's very, very hard to judge from that one measurement level whether the battery is okay or not because especially at that frequency it's very hard to tell make a statement about the state of health of the battery and important is as well is that in lithium ion battery because the changes are so small you need a much more accurate instrument but in principle it's the same measurement principle that you can use accuracy is important and also there is one thing that you need to bear in mind is, is at the moment, you see a trend of people moving away from lead-acid batteries and using lithium-based batteries, which they then put in series. But if you put it in series, you need a battery management system or protection board. And if you measure that cell or that, that battery at the end of the day, which probably then has the same voltage, nominal voltage, as a lead-acid battery because it was a replacement, you have to consider that there's also a battery management system inside. And when you measure, you also measure that battery management system. So you need to think about a lot more things than with a lead acid battery. It's all not a problem. You can still do this, but you need to consider much more things than you would do with a standard old style lead acid battery. When we're, yeah. when we're talking about maintenance, this is. Right. Yeah, I can see that because I do a lot with the RC type products and I've got a charger, a single charger does nickel metal hydride, my lipos and everything. And it tells me the charge state and it's got the, the board to be able to do the balance charging and everything like that. So something like that yeah. that's for hobby use is obviously much different than something that you're going to be producing for, you know, mass production of consumer and industrial type of products. Yeah, it is. And I mean, at the end of the day, what you would normally do, you would just use a charger typically, and that charger has an end voltage, which is typically 4.2 volts. And basically the from the charging method, the, the charger will stop, simply chop, stop charging. And if it doesn't, then you have a protection board in your RC batteries that would prevent any damage from happening or occurring to those batteries. So in terms of knowing whether or not for my batteries, you know, like we said, going to a gas station, it's pretty easy to tell if the battery's good or not. But when it comes to like the lithium ion ones, the only way that I really know if it's bad is either the cell is puffed and then I'm just waiting for a fire to happen. Or, I mean, sometimes you, you see the cell differences. Uh, if you look closely, you can see some of the cell differences. But to be honest, I'm not even sure what range and difference is good or bad. So, I mean, that's one thing that I've always struggled with. There is no such thing which, well, in lead acid batteries, you even have instruments or tools. I call them tools, not instruments, that basically give you an okay for a battery that is considered to be okay and not okay if it's not. So a red and green light, basically, that says it's okay or it's not okay. I'm not sure if that's actually a good way of doing that even with lead acid batteries, because if you have a bigger battery, then obviously the internal resistance is, is much smaller than with a large battery. Temperature also makes a huge difference. So honestly, I don't know how you want to make a judgment, which is like red green by just putting some sort of black box from Amazon onto a battery and then it gives you some sort of result. I don't know how that's supposed to work in the first place. With lead acid, that's what they spec these units for, these instro products. For lithium ion batteries, you can basically completely forget that because you have different sort of materials. You have your battery management systems, you have your protection boards or battery management systems that are all involved. Also, it's really important to, again, look at what is the temperature, what is the frequency at which you measure. You need to know your battery actually quite well to be able to make a judgment of the state of health of that product based on just a resistance measurement. You can do it, but you need to know your battery very well, which means for your RC cells, you need to use the same kind of RC cells over a long time to actually also understand what is the resistance value of that when it's the good battery and then how does it develop when you don't use it, when you had so and so many cycles flying your RC drones or whatever that is. And also one of the things that's really important when you look at that is 
you need to make precise measurements on cell level really. So just measuring a pack doesn't show you anything because if it's serious, then you don't know which cell is actually affected. You might have cells which are absolutely fine and one is just broken. So how do you want to find that broken cell if you just measure the whole pack? Yeah, exactly. In terms of moving from, obviously, there's some areas that have already moved into lipos, but uh, I'm guessing there's a lot of areas that are still using um, lead acid and they want to move to lithium ion. You know, what are some of the key things that you'd uh, recommend people have to consider when making that kind of a switch? I think one of the key bits is, first of all, cost, because lead acid-based batteries are still much cheaper than lithium ion-based batteries. So cost is one of the things, space is one of the things. A lead acid battery is the same capacity, it, it takes a lot more space than with the lithium ion battery. So one of the charming things about LIPS is that you can get the same energy into much less space than with a standard VLRA battery or lead acid battery. One of the other things that you have to consider is the temperature environment in which you run these batteries. So for example, uh, sometimes, for example, in the rail industry, very often you have battery packs or um, backup batteries being used somewhere outside in the field. Now, you're located in Chicago, right? Yes. So you know cold in Chicago as well. One of the things lithium-ion batteries don't like is cold. So when you buy an electric car today, they will always try to sell you a heat pack. It's like a heating system for your battery pack. And the simple reason is because, especially in the winter, it, the, the outside temperature has a massive effect on how much charge you can get out of your batteries. If you currently drive an e-car, uh, well, not currently, but if you drive an e-car with current lithium-ion batteries, it makes a huge difference when you, whether you do one trip in winter or in the summer. So I've got a colleague who travels from Amsterdam to Frankfurt regularly and the outside temperature does make a huge difference on his mileage in his car. So <laughs> depending on where he's got to have a cup of coffee to recharge his car is, is really depending as well on, on the outside temperature. And oh. so temperature is a very, very important factor to look at as well. Yeah, I always thought because I actually have a, a Prius and I always thought that most of my battery, uh, let's call it my mileage, goes down mm -hmm. dramatically in the wintertime. And I figured, well, that's because I'm running a heater and the heater's draining the battery and therefore I'm not getting as much distance as I normally would. It's probably a mix. On one side, yes, you have more, you have a heater. And on the other side, it's cold for the battery. So the battery is not going to be as, it's not going to perform as well as in the summer, for example. Right. So it, it's, you, yeah, I assume you drive, you, you're you talking about a plug-in Prius, right? No, mine's a, mine's a hybrid. Mine's the a mild hybrid. hybrid. Okay. Yeah. That's not lithium-ion batteries, actually. That is nickel metal hydrid batteries. Yeah, it's an old so, one, so. Yeah, but it still runs, right? Yep, I, I, it'll mm -hmm. run until the day I die, I think. It's <laughs> doing well by me. So in, in terms of the battery monitoring and control, it seems like that's obviously the key to everything. You gotta monitor, you gotta be able to control through software the different states and how much you're gonna drain and how much mm -hmm. you're actually gonna charge. What have you seen as some of the most stringent applications where you really have to pay attention to the state of charge and how you're actually monitoring and even controlling the battery? you see an awful lot of effort going into selecting batteries so pair matching of batteries so every battery has an internal resistance and you try to match the internal resistance and the look of this internal resistance curve of a lithium-ion battery as, as close as possible to get the maximum performance out of your pack and for your prius probably that effort wouldn't be necessary because whether you achieve 99% of efficiency with your pack or whether you achieve 101% doesn't really matter. But there are a couple of applications, of course, where this does make a huge difference. So just if you look at race cars, for example, which have, at least in Europe, in the big tournament, they have included electric boosters or electric engine components as well. And when they choose the battery cells to make up the packs, that's all handmade stuff. When you see these kind of things being made, they will 
check every single cell and pair match every single cell to make sure that all these cells are working beautifully together and they have the same kind of internal resistance curve. An internal resistance curve in terms of they're looking at various frequencies. There's typically a, they basically take every single cell, do a frequency sweep over that single cell battery and from the outcome they decide to which pack do they put that together. So that is one thing that you have seen already a while ago with like professional racing cars. You now also see that happening with truck manufacturers, like companies making battery packs for trucks, which have a much higher capacity. And you can also see that for special vehicles. So for example, we've got a customer who has purchased battery testers to make this kind of pair matching because they're building they're building trucks which go into expeditions somewhere into the desert or into Antarctica. And basically the lithium ion cells that they use, they are the, the main means of powering the entire system. And then of course they want to be absolutely sure that those battery cells are 100% okay and that they match each other. Because what you don't want to have is you don't want to have that, that one single cell that, that plays up because it has a higher resistance and therefore the whole thing goes, the whole system isn't as performant as otherwise. Well, or probably I'm, I'm something even heats up or something like that. That would be the worst case you want to have, you want to avoid. Yeah. I'm still amazed at the race cars, even in F1, that they actually use batteries. And I was thinking with those finely tuned engines, I think I just read about it a few months ago. I think I'm a little bit behind the times, but I was amazed to hear that they actually had battery systems to give them boosts and things like that. Over here in Germany, I don't know how it's in the US. I think in the US, especially California, it's, it's like the Prius country really, is it? That's how it all started. Now, Germany has always been very, very traditional when it comes to the car. And if you talk especially to older people over here, like my kind of age, you've got a lot of people who, who basically say, well, I don't really want to drive electric cars because there's nothing that beats the feeling of driving a combustion engine car. But just if you look at the design of an electric car, you put the batteries typically very, very low. So the, the batteries in, in an electric car, they sit very, very close to the, to the bottom of the car, which means that this car actually sits firmly on the ground because the weight is very much at the bottom of the car. And then you have acceleration possibilities in an electric car, which you will never have in a normal combustion engine car. Probably you have that in, in, in a racing car or something like that, but that is not something you can buy to drive on the motorway. And if you look at the speed and the acceleration you can get out of even a normal electric car, that's really, really cool to drive. That's a really fun drive part. So from that point of view, I think electric cars and batteries, for me, it's no wonder that there is actually, that they are also going into racing cars as well, because there is definitely also an advantage in that, especially when it comes to accelerating. Right, yeah, exactly. Over here, we have a Formula, we even have a Formula E, like a electric racing series only, a very much driven by universities. So pretty much every technical university over here in Europe has a Formula team and they're building their own electric cars and they're driving races against each other. And then it's, it's a really competitive thing nowadays, but it's all electric nowadays. So you're saying we've moved on from the days of the electric solar car to see how long we can go to actually racing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Time flies. Time yes. Flies. But if you think that that wasn't that long ago, right? I mean, right. this kind of like put a solar panel on, on the university car and see how long it goes. That wasn't a long, that wasn't a long time ago. And it's interesting because we are a manufacturer of this kind of test equipment. We get regularly approached by these teams and by these student teams. And they of course want to have some sort of assistance with test and measurement equipment as well, because even they do pair matching of cells. All right. So right. It's, it's not only the professionals, but it's also the students who have figured out that this makes an impact. So very often we have the situation that we loan instruments to them and they just then use that to measure a new batch of cells coming in. And they're actually also doing a lot of R&D when it comes to these kind of things as well. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. 
You know, we talked a lot about, uh, obviously, around batteries and uh, measurements and stuff, but I mean, with your focus on precision measurement, mm -hmm. does that uh, translate into other areas? Then that's why you guys are, uh, let's say, in certain areas in terms of test equipment. Can you take this knowledge and your quest for accuracy into other areas? What other kinds of equipment does that uh, actually apply itself to? So I think we have the same situation as, as a formula or a, a racing car, a car company that invests into a racing car team. They put all this kind of high-end stuff in the racing car, but after a while you can see it kind of trickle down into the normal mass-produced cars. And you can see some kind of the same thing with us because, yes, we're making high-end current sensors. We're making high-end current sensors that let you measure 800 amps at 4 megahertz, stuff like that. But that technology and that knowledge and that experience, of course, also, let's say, trickles down into a standard clamp meter, for example. Our clamp meters are really, really precise. And one of the reasons is because there is so much knowledge in the company about this whole topic. And um, we have this with current sensors, with clamp meters. We have this with resistance meters, insulation testers, but of course, also battery testers. Because if you look at our handheld battery tester, that is actually the, the measuring technology inside of it is exactly the same one as a benchtop industry battery tester. It's the same measurement part. Of course, the focus is totally different when you make a handheld product compared to making a benchtop product. You need to look at completely different things. So for example, bench, you need to look at accuracy, speed, you need to have lab view integration, things like that. A handheld one has to have an ease of use, a rugged design, you need a cloud link nowadays. So it's different kind of focus, but the measurement principle and the measurement technology is the same. So you find a lot of high-end measurement technology in, let's say, maintenance standard products or mass market products as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, if you've got it, why not put it into the other applications? So that's <laughs> obviously it reflects well and that's why your product line probably looks like it does. Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things which are like, one of the things that always struck me is like when I started to work with Hioki is like, okay, they do impedance analyzers and LCR meters and battery testers. How does that work together? Well, actually, if you look closer at it, a battery tester is some kind of an impedance analyzer or an impedance meter. It just has a DC bias, an automatic DC bias in front of it. Now I say it just has... It just, it makes it sound absolutely easy, but actually the measurement principle and the measurement technology is fairly similar. Of course, there's big differences in it, but it kind of explains why we do both. And even though from looking outside an impedance analyzer and a battery tester is a completely different thing, inside from a measurement point of view, it makes sense. Excellent. You know, I could continue talking to you for hours today, but I guess we probably all have to get back to our day jobs but before we go i always like to throw out some quick fire questions for you so in terms of the craziest applications that you've seen your product be used in what would you say the most unique or the craziest uh, usage of one of your equipment's been in it is actually a fairly boring application and nowadays it's probably even more normal but when i first heard that they are actually doing pair matching of cells I just thought, okay, this is completely crazy. Why, why would you do that? And then it took a while for me to understand. Now it makes perfect sense to me. I explained it to you before. It's like as if it's the most normal thing. But when you hear it for the first time and how much accuracy they're trying to get out, how much extra oomph they're trying to get out of that system. When I heard that the first time, I was really like completely surprised about that. So I thought that's completely crazy and probably over the top. Um, nowadays, I don't think it's over the top anymore. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that it sounds crazy and makes you feel better. <laughs> so what are you uh, what are you working on this weekend? Have you got any hobbies that are uh, interesting? Is it around electronics or what do you do for fun? I've got a, a bench. I've got a bench top in my shack, if you want it like that, with six Raspberry Pis on top of it and about six projects which I want to do with Raspberry Pis. And one of them is a, is a ham radio application because I'm a ham radio, I'm a licensed ham radio what do you call like uh, operator is operator it? exactly yeah. so that's kind of a hobby and of course as you say now we can get out again so we have to make the best best out of that as well exactly but, yeah 
So the final one, and this is one that's close to, to my heart because my daughter and I share a, a love for Marvel, but uh, who's your favorite superhero and why? My favorite superhero? Um, I don't really have a superhero, and probably because the time I grew up wasn't a Marvel time because Marvel was quite big, I think, before me and after me. So my kind of last superhero was the role that uh, Tom Cruise played in Top Gun. But I was 13 years old then. I kind of figured out fairly quickly that that was only a movie and that wasn't real. So since then, superheroes, I didn't have any, actually. Maybe I was disappointed of Tom Cruise's role. I don't know, but <laughs> I never had any more superheroes. All right. Well, I'll send you a book on Iron Man and see if we can change your mind. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I will so, read it uh, after finishing all my Raspberry Pi projects. There you go. There you go. So if our, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to, to reach you? LinkedIn. All right. LinkedIn. Excellent. LinkedIn. All right. LinkedIn well, is really the, the best nowadays. To, it's so easy. So LinkedIn's yep. perfect. Just look for uh, Kai Sharman. Just look for Kai Sharman on LinkedIn. And um, there's not too many Kai Shamans on LinkedIn. All right. Well, Cliff Ortmeyer's either. Yeah. I found you immediately. Yeah. There you go. It's Excellent. unique. It's perfect. So, uh, hey, you know, I want to thank you for joining the Innovation Experts uh, podcast. And for everybody listening, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. And I'd like to encourage you to check out Kai Sharman and Hioki to find out more about their specialist products and services. Thanks a lot. like to hear what you have to say about how test and measurement equipment supports innovation in your industry so please get in touch with us at technology at farnell.com if you enjoyed the podcast don't forget to subscribe on spotify apple music or wherever you get your podcasts all right i'll see you all for another interview on the innovation experts very soon until then thanks for listening